are here in part three of the Lent series, Worship in the Wilderness. Sam and Sara kind of kicked off our series last week where Sara talked about a spirit-filled journey, spirit-led journey into the wilderness. Sam talked about a simple journey, and I'm going to continue on that series talking about a sorrowful journey. And as I think about sorrow, I'm actually going to start off talking about a little bit of what Calvin already said about my own journey and story and share maybe a bit personally in something that I haven't actually shared with many people about a desert season in my own life, a season of grief and sorrow for me. As was mentioned, I grew up in a family that was charismatic, kind of Pentecostal, non-denominational, for those of you who know that term. Uh, My parents were very active in my church, very active in evangelism and mission. I remember going out on the streets of Minneapolis when I was five or six years old with my dad on Friday night, where he spent the, spent the evenings evangelizing and seeing people come to know the Lord. We would hop on a bus um, and go 24 hours from Minnesota, which is at the top of the United States, all the way down to Mexico, where the 20 of us, my, my sister and older brother and um, younger sister, older brother, my parents, and several of us from the church would dress up as clowns and do a week of VBS um, for the children there. Then we moved to Romania where we spent several years doing um, pioneering humanitarian projects. My parents built orphanage and Bible school. I was involved in food distribution, clothes distribution, also saw incredible things from that God was doing there in Romania in the early 90s. Fast forward years later to um, meeting Jeremy at grad school, we got married and found ourselves in the most unreached people group, most unreached nation of the world, a year and a half after we got married. And we saw things that kind of you only read about in, in books or hear about and don't actually believe yourself. We would walk out on the streets with, with our friends that would come over and join us for these prayer gatherings, see people healed, see Muslims saved. See, he see people knocking on church doors saying, tell me what I've got to do to be saved because Jesus showed up to me in a vision last night. If you want to hear more of this, I think next Tuesday night I'll be sharing just a bit more about our time in, in Turkey. And in the middle of that, we had our first daughter, Amira. And she, um, crazy, wild, we were traveling in so many different places that for the first year of her life, she didn't live in a home or a bed more than two weeks because we were constantly on the road, traveling, ministering. It was crazy. Probably due to the craziness, I find myself pregnant again after just a few few months <laughs> of, of that. And, and, and we're like, all right, this is part of the adventure, you know? God's, got, God's timing is perfect. That's fine. Not, not quite what we had planned. But then... Um, it was a shock, but then just after a few few um, hours, not even 24 hours after we had made the announcement, Angela is 14 weeks pregnant with second baby on the way, um, the unexpected happens. I find myself in a hospital bed where we're trying to find the heartbeat and there's no heartbeat. And at that moment, Jeremy and I go, they're, they're, God, this isn't possible. We're seeing miracles and signs and wonders, and yet we're sitting in the reality of something that is not what I'm contending for and not what I see and not that makes sense in my own life. And from that tragedy of miscarriage, it really threw me off. Because I went from, God is awesome, and he always answers our prayers, and we're seeing breakthrough and signs and wonders to this can't be my life. This can't happen to me. Not God's favorite one. (laughs) Not the one that in church I, I believe for miracles and I see them happen and I'm contending for them. This isn't me. And I didn't know how to handle life when it wasn't what I prayed for, when I didn't know how to handle my grief and disappointment. So when wilderness was thrust upon me, the muscle of my spirituality responsible for navigating grief and sorrow in a healthy way was really weak, I found out. My muscle of lament was way underdeveloped. And maybe because of the church experience or your background, maybe you have an underdeveloped lament muscle too, or maybe it's because of culture that we grow up in. One of the most... um, 
amazing things that I found about British culture is that you guys, are, you live, keep calm, and live it on really, really well. I mean, your stipper, step upper lip is amazing. Like, I, it's amazing. I'm fascinated by it. Wow. Like, like you guys just get on with it. And I, and it, it's, it's really amazing. But I don't know if actually that's true or if things are really bothering you or they're really not. I can't actually tell. I don't, I can't. It still throws me for a loop after being here for four years. So I've seen my friends struggle with, experience struggles and fears and doubts and disappointment and anger. And yet, so often I go, there's got to be more under the surface. Are you just brushing it under the surface and not actually dealing with it? Are you pretending like everything is okay or is actually everything okay? And what I think is that that lament muscle maybe is underdeveloped here too. But I believe that we, to, we must learn to walk the way of lament and learn the language of lament for a deep, robust, healthy spirituality. Because learning the language of lament deepens our faith. Let's just talk for a few minutes about what lament means or what it is. So I've been on a very personal journey of learning how to worship God in the wilderness. It's been illuminating and comforting and very liberating to see how much raw, honest complaint is found throughout the Bible. Lament comes in many forms and is found throughout scripture as a full range of response to problems in the human condition. Some lament is directed towards God, some is towards the enemy, some is individual and isolated and extremely personal, others is communal and comprehensive to society or to the world. And although I first began to see this in Psalms, I'm seeing that throughout the Bible, people are constantly praying heartfelt, totally honest prayers of distress, of disappointment, of anger, frustration, sorrow. It's all there. No experience is too difficult to be brought before God. And we see this through the prayers and complaints of Hannah and Hagar, Solomon, David, Mordecai, Moses, Mary, Martha, and Jesus, just to name a few. Even, the whole, even a whole book in the Bible is called Lamentations. I think God is okay with our grumpy, angry, confused emotions. And not only is he okay with it, but he wants to hear it. He's open and warm and eager to know what we're really feeling and how we're doing, especially in the midst of crisis. We know a, an approach, a personal and accessible God. He's personal and accessible and welcomes and desires our honesty and worship. He doesn't consider a lack of faith or insult or sin to be honest with him and come before him with total vulnerability. So my first challenge, I guess, this morning is stop sweeping your emotions under the carpet. God wants you to be totally honest and open and vulnerable. He's okay with that. And actually, your superficial upper lip isn't helpful, and it's probably causing us to stay in the superficials, the shallow end, when God is inviting us in to a deeper relationship and deeper walk with him. Honesty with God about how we're really doing and feeling gives us the opportunity to leave the shallow end of the pool and wade into the depths. Lament deepens our faith. And sometimes it deepens our faith most often by bringing our most intense theological questions right out into the open. To me, it sounded like this. God, this isn't how it was supposed to be. I am 27. This isn't the way that I thought my life would go at this point. Why is this happening to me? Why me, God? That doesn't make sense. It's not cool. It's not right. It's not fair. It's not part of my plan. And maybe to you it sounds different, but we all, ha God welcomes that. He welcomes our honest complaint and openness before him. But that emotion and honesty isn't just left resolved because our lament is anchored in and finds resolution in the character of God. 
Our lament, our complaint, our sorrow, our grief is anchored in and finds resolution in the character of God because the very attributes for which we praise God are those we invoke in time of need. We see this in Psalms a lot. For example, Psalms 42, in which the lament, my tears have been my food both day and night, leads to a statement of resolute trust. Hope in God, for I will again praise him my savior, my help, and my God. And we can only grow fluent in the language of lament when we experience God's character in the midst of our struggle and our pain. When, we're, when we get to know something about the character of God we didn't know before, we're going through struggle, we're going through disappointment, facing troubles of many kinds, loss, hurt in our life, in career, in academics, in relationships, in ministry, you name it. Maybe it's very personal. We can all identify maybe an area in our life where we feel that. And we invite God into the questions and sorrows and disappointment. Then we learn something of God's heart we couldn't have known before and otherwise. In moments of crisis, we learn God's heart in ways we couldn't have known otherwise. We know God as healer, as comforter, as redeemer, and liberator, and friend. Another quick story of Jeremy and I, um, just a few months after we had been dating, we decided to go to a young adults conference, a worship conference, maybe some of you know it, it's called IHOP, International House of Prayer. We went there 2014 to 15, it ends right at midnight in 2015. And so being the very smart seminarians that we were, we decided we're going to beat all the New Year's traffic and we're going to head... um, This was in Kansas. We had to drive to Virginia, which is about 10, 12 hours. Is that about right? We said, we're going to beat all that traffic. We're going to do it in the night, you know, get to our door room so we can um, have a full night's sleep before the next day. So we jump in our car. It's like 1230 at night. We drive for about two hours, and all of a sudden, my um, old school Toyota Corolla decides to um, have a major meltdown. So I pull over to the side of the road, and here, Jeremy, side of him that I had never seen before, jumps into action. He rummages quickly through my glove compartment, grabs out the AAA papers, calls a tow truck, gets us to 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 a hotel just to exit away. And before I could even walk into the lobby, he comes outside with where I'm sitting in the car, kind of getting our stuff together to come in with the mechanic's number of when we can call him in the morning and two room keys. And not only was he a protector of my car and who I was, but he was also protector of my purity and my, but I knew, but I'm not saying that to make everybody clap. I'm saying that, that I got to know God and Jeremy in a way that I didn't know him before. And in moments of crisis, we get to know God in ways that we didn't know before. But also we know God in maybe ways that we hadn't wanted to or hadn't wanted to seen about God before. We know not only the um, David's God of the quiet waters, but we also know Jonah's God of the violent storm. We get to know not only the God who says yes, but also the God who says no. We learn the ways of the God of Israel who fights for us and wins our battles, but also the God of Jacob who fights with us and leaves us limping. We know the God of Job who not only gives abundantly, but he also takes away abundantly too. We know the God of Hannah who not only created laughter that cleanses, but also tears that cleanse too. We know the father of the Israelite slaves who hears our cries for deliverance and rushes in, extending his right arm in miraculous ways like the parting of the Red Sea. But we also hear the heartbeat of the father who is totally silent in his son's own cries for help as he journeyed from Gethsemane to the cross. We can learn a lot from Jesus' lament And I find as I study that passage of Jesus in Gethsemane, I find that even Jesus prayed a prayer that wasn't answered or wasn't answered in the way that he expected or wanted it to be. Even Jesus asked his father to deliver him from suffering, right? All things are possible with you, God. Take this cup from me. 
take this cup from me, answer me, heal me. My babies die in here, God. You can do it. You can do all things are possible with you. Take this cup from me, God. And we rebuke Satan, and that's what I did growing up. And I still do that. This is not your will. This is not right. I curse evil. I fight. I contend and pray. And Jesus wrestled and wept and interceded. And then what did he do? He prayed, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. What? He didn't keep contending for a miracle. No interceding for the breakthrough. No praying for deliverance. Jesus had faith to trust God even when the miracle never came. And I guess my question is, do we have faith to trust God even if a miracle never comes, even if the breakthrough never comes in the way that we expect or want it to? Jesus relinquished control. He surrendered to his Father's will. Pete Gregg, in his book, God on Mute, calls this a darker faith. He says, there is faith for life, and then there is also a darker faith for death. There is faith for miracles, but also for pain. There is faith for God's will when it is our will too, but there is also the grace to trust God when his will isn't what we would choose. And we find that Jesus, Jesus became fluent in this language of lament, culminating with his obedient suffering and death on the cross in It seemed like silence of God, his father. But we know that silence doesn't mean absence. And God wasn't far off looking from the sidelines, watching his son suffer. But he was active and engaged and present. And because Jesus fully entered into into our humanity, he gets it. He gets it. He has a whole and complete and ultimate identification with our pain and misery and sorrow and sickness and sin. He gets it and he gets us. And our stories, he's walked our road. He's endured the process to get to the other side. And he walks with us in our seasons of sorrow and disappointment. God knows how to grieve and he knows how to hold us when we do. So our stories of lament invite us to be closer to Jesus and to be held by him. Lament is really an invitation to intimacy. And our language of lament can invite us into an aspect of God's heart that we didn't know before. However we got here, however we find ourselves on this path of sorrow, wilderness is also the pathway of intimacy found no other way. Knowing Jesus in his suffering and lament is the only way to make sense of our own suffering and lament. Identifying with the suffering of Jesus in our own suffering will anoint you to bring his presence to others. When we are honest and vulnerable with Jesus, inviting him into our own experience of lament, it opens us up to an oil of intimacy, that intimacy found through trials and sorrows and grief. And if we give way to that, if we let ourselves endure, if we give ourselves to the process of suffering and identify with Jesus in there, we allow the crushing to purify us and refine us more into his character and likeness. And these, yeah, and that hurts. The process of lament hurts. It's painful it's not, it's not a pleasant one, right? I mean, the process of producing pure oil is usually a very painful one too, right? I mean, only by crushing and squeezing and refining are olives made into oil, yeah? There's that process there. But our Gethsemane, Gethsemane moments crush us, but we aren't left crushed. He who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it in Christ Jesus. He works all things for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Why? 
so that we will be transformed and conformed into the image of his son, Jesus. In Christ, we become refined and purified and deepened, but we've got to allow this process of laments refining to do its purifying work in us so that Jesus can do his healing work through us. There's this process of allowing Jesus to take our suffering, to take that pain and transform it into something by which we can bring healing to others. But this takes staying the course. In Romans 5, Paul says, we exalt also in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance, and perseverance proven character, proven character hope, and hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. In James 1, James exhorts us, consider it all joy. My brothers and sisters, when you encounter various trials, trials of all kinds, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. And the author of Hebrews urges us, Therefore, since we have so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us run with endurance the race set before us, fixing our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. For consider him who endured such hostility by sinners against himself, so that you will not grow weary and lose heart. And we all love the verse, he makes all things beautiful in his time, but time actually means at designated time after a season has been completed. The season, this grieving season, a sorrowful season has to be worked out and completed in order to reach the resulting beauty. So we have to let endurance have its perfect result. Stay the course. Don't fret out early. Don't cop out. Don't stuff your feelings under the rug and not work through the things that will actually bring healing and intimacy with Jesus. Work through those things. And it's here, it's at this point where we want to lose heart, where we don't want to deal with some things that we've got to set our eyes on Jesus. It says, fix your eyes Jesus, we get so distracted sometimes by looking at, at our circumstances or our problems or our suffering, and it's, it's so easy to do. And actually, God wants us to do that, but he also wants us to focus on him, to refocus our eyes on Jesus Christ, the hope of glory. There is certain hope even in the midst of the mess and the chaos because Jesus is our hope. Jesus will make all things new. And lament is also an eschatological prayer, excuse me. It always looks to the future as we yearn for resolution. It's that tension of, yeah, things aren't right now, but God, Christ in us, hope of glory, you will make all things new. We began in a journey, it would garden, and we're journeying to a garden. And we're not there yet, but one day we will be celebrating the great wedding feast. We will be. We've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. Our momentary affliction wanes in comparison with the eternal glory that's to come. So in our current story of deep despair, whatever that looks like, we can trust a God whose plans and purposes and eternal story is bigger and better and way beyond what we could ever dream or imagine. Yeah. So surrender to the process. Hang in there. Give into the crushing that gives way to purity. Lament is hard. It hurts. It doesn't feel good. And you know what? I think it's supposed to. I think it has to. But what beauty of the redemption of Jesus that he takes our most painful moments and through inviting him into our lament He transforms this. He transforms the pain and the disappointment and the bitterness and these questions and sorrow into something beautiful and healing 
and fruitful. The comfort that we are comforted with, we can comfort others with. The love that we are loved with, we can love others with. The peace and grace and mercy and kindness that we are embraced with, we can embrace others with. Let's live as people of sorrow and lament who really have something valuable and substantial and real to offer the world. Oil that really heals, water that really quenches, love that really brings freedom, peace that really comforts. Here is the oil of intimacy refined, now becoming the oil of healing, the balm of Gilead, the oil of gladness instead of mourning. As we know Christ better in our moments of greatest vulnerability, his character is formed in us and we become reflections of his character and offer others a thirst-quenching drink of living water, a foretaste of heaven, a glimpse of the garden, of the way things were intended to be. By Christ's abiding presence in the midst of our suffering, we can minister his character and affections to others. Your current suffering is anointing you to minister Christ's healing presence to others. Let me say that again. And I'll invite the band to come up and we can respond to this. Your current suffering is anointing you to minister Christ's healing presence to others.